It looks like we're going to start again. A third time is a charm. Okay, ready? Are we rolling? Now we have a microphone again. Okay. Hi, I'm Pastor John Rickard of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Newark, Delaware. Welcome to our Bible study on the Book of Romans. Today we will finish chapter 7. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, in our baptism you created in us a new nature, which is our true Christian self. Sadly, within us lies our old nature that wars against your will, just as surely as our new baptismal nature rejoices in doing your will. Grant us forgiveness and strengthen us to live in the power of our baptism as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we are uh, in chapter 7. We're going to be beginning with verse 7, and we're going to finish the chapter today. So we're going to have to move fairly quickly. And to do that, why don't we just begin by reading verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law... I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So what then shall we say? That's obviously a reference to everything he has said before, especially about the law, the commandments, and how they reveal sin. And so uh, if the law is condemning us as sinners, then... Uh, do we say that the law is sin? May Ginato, once again, that very strong denial. No, never, impossible. Don't be stupid. Don't be crazy. The law is not sin. Uh, yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. It isn't, if it hadn't been for the law, I would not have been a sinner. It's that Without the law, I would have not have known it was sin. I would have been walking along in ignorance. If I could use a comparison from uh, the past, in the 1950s, in the 1940s, in the 1930s, people smoked blissfully unaware that it was causing cancer. The Surgeon General came along in the 60s and began saying, hey, this isn't good for us. This is something that will cause cancer. The Surgeon General did not cause the cancer. He simply opened our eyes to the risk that smoking posed. It was just as dicey an operation in the 40s and the 30s as it was in the 60s and on. We just didn't know. That's what the law was there. The Surgeon General telling us that what we were doing was causing death. Sin causes death. The law tells us that, but it, it lets us know that, but it doesn't cause it. Um, I would not, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said you shall not covet. Now, the Greek word there is epithumesis. Uh, epithumesis. And epithumesis, covet's okay, but it really is more like a, a desire. Uh, and it covers far more than just the commandment, thou shalt not covet. Uh, all of the breaking of the Ten Commandments springs from a sinful desire. And so this ties back to verse 5, where Paul had, had said, uh, had spoken about our sinful passions. And if you remember last week, we had that discussion that looked forward to this coveting question, and now we're in that coveting question. So our sinful passions, our sinful desires, give birth to sinful actions. So we have James one uh, fifteen that says, "When desire, uh, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death." Notice James isn't talking about the law there. He's talking about this desire which is in us, whether the law has been proclaimed or not. And Paul wrote uh, to the Ephesians, 
put off your old self, your old man. Remember, Paul is talking about this whole old man, new man uh, dichotomy. So you put off that old self, which belongs to your former matter of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So this is uh, what's going on here. Uh, so uh, it's not the law's fault. We have this sinful desire in us that sin was present. He already covered even before the giving of the law. And the evidence for that is the fact that we die. By the way, if you're new to this, if you have a question or something, you can just type it in and good Lord willing, we will see it's typed in and I, I can respond to it. And we have a spinning circle of death. Um, it says we're live. I have no idea how this is actually showing because it's showing me nothing but a spinning circle of death. So, ah, and I see it's right where I was praying to boot. Oh yeah, we're well, we're frozen at uh, a minute and seven seconds, and and uh, you know that's seven minutes ago. Well, we'll just have to push on, and hopefully, uh, it's broadcasting, and we'll be able to uh, see the finished product. I guess. Good but Lord if anybody willing. asks anything, there's no way for me to, to know it yet. Okay. So hold off on those comments. <laughs> Verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. When he says it lies dead, it does not mean he does not mean that it is non existent. But it's a little bit more snoozy, shall we say, because the law tells me all these various ways that I should be and things that I should not do. My sin nature becomes aware of all these opportunities to sin. And we talked about this last week when I used the analogy about uh, the electric socket and you want to warn your child about not putting the butter knife in the electric socket, but then you wonder if I give them that warning, will I put the idea in their head? So this is what he's talking about here. Based on uh, this verse, we understand that covering is, we already said, covering far more than just the, the commandment thou shalt not covet. So we have all of these natural, fallen natural, fallen nature, natural sinful desires that the law reveals and if you don't have a new nature it actually promotes oddly enough not the law's fault it's the sin that is within us our old man therefore the argument this is just who i am this is natural for me this is normal for me really is not the same thing as saying it is right everybody feels right doesn't mean you are. There is an objective right and wrong. The objective right is the will of God. The objective wrong is outside the will of God. But our will, our nature, our fallen nature may feel right, may feel normal for us. That does not make it so. As a matter of fact, if you say, uh, this is just who I am, what we probably really mean most of the times is, this is who I, a sinner, am. Paul is going to develop this idea more. So we're going to push on to verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. I like the fact that Paul does not say you. He says I. He's making this deeply personal. Yet also you have to realize that he does not mean I, Paul, not you. This is my problem. I'm just telling you about a problem I have. I know you guys don't have it because you're super saints and super righteous and super pious. Paul isn't saying that at all. In fact, if you think about this for a minute, when Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, what's going to happen to it? Books were darn expensive. 
So as a rule of thumb, people did not have their own copy of the letters of Paul. Instead, they went to church and they were read, pretty much like a normal worship service is for us, where the books of the Bible are read, and then, you know, the minister does a sermon about one portion of the scriptures that were read, typically. So here you got Joe Christian in the Roman congregation reading Paul's letter to the church, and he reads, I was once alive apart from the law. All of a sudden, it's no longer Paul, it's the lector, the reader. And that's what Paul wants. He wants each one of us to say, I hear. I was once alive apart from the law. That is to say, I lived my life however I want. I was true to myself, blah, 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 blah. Everything that we're told is the secret to happiness in, in, in our country. I was alive once apart from the law, but when the commandment came, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not have sinful passions. Sin came alive and I died. All of a sudden I'm walking around going, oh no, this is why so much energy is spent trying to convince people to not feel guilty when they do something wrong. Because you're trying to get back to that, I didn't know right from wrong. I didn't know my left from my right hand sort of a thing. Well, the fact of the matter is that the law does convict us and makes us very much aware that we're outside the will of God and we're destined for the grave. The law exposes our sinful nature. But once again, it does not create it. It just exposes it. The very commandment, verse 10, the very commandment that promises life proved to be death to me. The commandment that promises life proved to be death. This is the deception of our fallen nature. It always assumes that we are the authors of our own life. And you can think of a lot of pop psychology, pop philosophy today, which talks about us creating our own reality and all that sort of, and I'm going to say it, stupid ideas. And if you think that you create your own reality, you have bought a lie. I will say that again. If you think you create your own reality, you are believing a lie. You are living in a fantasy. And if you think differently than that, then let me ask you about the last time you were sick and I want to know why you created that reality. Or if you, you know, fell off of a curb or something and broke your leg because of gravity. Why, why? did you create that reality? I know. If you lost a loved one, did you, have your parents died? Have any of your brothers and sisters died? Even worse, has your child died? Why did you create that reality, you terrible person? Why did you create World War II? Why did you create that terrible blast over in Lebanon if you create your, the reality that we live in? No, don't buy that lie. Don't go for that stupid apple. The law exposes death. Ah. Uh, the very commandment that promised life. So, you know, but that's what law promises. It says, you know, do this and you shall live. But the reality is we never can do this. Our old man, our old nature, our unbaptized person has not the power to do this. And so that promise of good, that promise of a reward that the old nature buys in, it says, what goes around comes around. If I'm just good enough, I will merit a happy afterlife, turns up to be empty and void. So, verse 11. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and thought it, and through it killed me. This is what the commandments do to the old nature. This is what Paul is setting up. The old nature, the old man, says, I can do that, I can be good, and we try to do good and we fail and so we're revealed as a sinner and as a sinner 
we are doomed to hell. Or the old man just rebels and says, forget this being good. Again, the end result is the same. We're exposed as sinners and we go to hell. Uh, verse, oh, we already, that's what we're talking about. Okay. So the law exposes our sinful core. It then becomes, uh, it then condemns us. There, again, it isn't the law's fault any more than it is the judge's fault. Again, another example of this. It's not the judge's fault for sentencing a convicted murderer, even if the murderer blames the judge, blames the jury, blames the witnesses, blames his mommy, his daddy, whoever. It's not their fault if he's a murderer and he gets convicted. Verse 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now just uh, note here how law and uh, commandment are pretty much equated. And consequently, we know that uh, they're being used here as synonyms in a way. I, you get more you know, nuanced one way and nuanced another way, but they are both agents that reveal our sin. They are holy, holy and righteous and good in and of themselves. Basically, what you got here is a perfect standard. It's as if you took a measuring uh, a yardstick. Here's a good example. Ever been to a carnival, state fair, something like that? And they have these wonderful rides. And at the rides, they'll have some sort of cartoon character holding his hand up like this. And it says, you must be this tall to go on this ride. Whatever it is, three foot, four foot, whatever. You have to be this tall. Well, it reveals whether or not you're tall enough to go on the ride. But it doesn't make you that tall. Or, or that less. short. Yes. It doesn't make you one way or the other. Right. That's what the law is. You got to be this tall. That's why sometimes it's called a rule because it shows you the standard. That's what uh, verse 12 is about. It's righteous, it's good. But what does it do? It shows us that we don't fall measure up. Short. We don't measure up. Verse 13. I got a million of these illustrations. The world is full of illustrations. Uh, verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? Is it the cartoon character holding his hand up fault that I'm not tall enough to go on the ride? By no means. By no means, is what he says. May Genito, he is really working that May Genito here in Romans, isn't he? That's but, that anathema word again. Like, yeah. it's, it, 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 that's, uh, Inconceivable! God forbid, <laughs> God forbid that that should ever be the case. Yeah, this is just... That's, a, that's blasphemous to think. But yeah, it, it's just plain dumb. You but know, it, it's, it's it, it cannot that. be. It's... it's, 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 it's you know, well, Cassia, literally, it may it not be, on. but you know, it, it's it's imperative. It's exclamation point. It no, is no, 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 no. no. Okay. Uh, he ties it with the blasphemy back in chapter one. Right. Uh, so it has that blasphemous undercurrent going with it. But basically, this is the strongest way that Paul can say. No, 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 no. Don't ever, ever think that. Don't ever, ever, ever. Yes, that's Believe right. That. Okay, may get a toe. So may it never be. Uh, mm. There we are, verse 13. Uh, did it bring death to me? By no means. Death was in the rule and war world and reigned from Adam to Moses, even though the law had not been given on Mount Sinai yet. Proof that it's not the law's fault that we are sinners and that we die. It was happening before 
the Ten Commandments was given. It's just that the law revealed why this was happening to us. So it was sin producing death in me, not law. Through what is good, it was revealing that to me. In order that sin might be shown to be sin. The law shows us the problem. It isn't the problem. It's not the cure either. But Jesus is the cure, by the way. But it shows us the problem. Uh, and through the commandment might become sinful. Be uh, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Because it revealed our sinful nature, our sinful nature rebels even more. Now, if you want to think of this with another analogy, it might be something like this. You got a broken leg, you go into the, and you, you know, a fracture or something, and it really feels bad. So you go in for the doctor, and the doctor takes an x ray, and he comes out and he says, You have a broken leg. We're going to put a cast on it or something like that. Well, it's not the x ray's fault that you have a broken leg. Or the doctor. Or the doctors, for that matter. That's right. The x ray revealed what your problem was, it did not cause the problem. Sin is the problem. The law is the x-ray. Are you getting tired of these homey <laughs> illustrations yet? Never. May it never be. <laughs> May it never be. May it get it, though. Okay. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Now, we should understand how Paul is going to be using the word flesh and spiritual here. Do not think in terms of carnate and uh, in our in, non carnate, uh, you know, corporal and non corporeal. That is a false dichotomy here. And it comes actually into the Western consciousness from the point of view of Greek mythology and Greek philosophy. It is not a biblical concept. To be spiritual does not mean to be out of the body or your soul. Your soul is spiritual and your body is non-spiritual or your soul is spirit and your body is flesh. That is not a biblical way of thinking. Instead, what we have here is uh, old man and new man, old nature and new nature, inside the will of God and outside the will of God sort of thinking and that becomes a full body sort of a thing body and soul so that's what we're we're moving into now so for we know that the law is spiritual it's not a reference to it's my conscience or something like that or my emotions it is a reference to the fact that it comes from god and it expresses the will of god and it is how the kingdom of God operates, shall we say. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I come into this kingdom of Christ, where everything operates within the harmony of Christ, the harmony of the triune God, and we discover, hey, this isn't how I operate. I have all these sinful desires. I have all this sinful passion. I have all this covetousness and hatred, and malice, and prejudice, and so forth and so on. And these things bring forth death. I'm putting my foot into the kingdom of life, and I'm bringing with me death. And I don't seem to be able to get away from it. So flesh means uh, sinful flesh under the sway of sin, fallen human nature, so forth. Spiritual then carries the ideas of pure, divine, righteousness, etc. Even when those things are physical. So the Holy Bible is spiritual. Jesus, the guy, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and so forth. Spiritual, clearly within the will of God. Baptism, even though there is water being poured on our heads. Spiritual, the Lord's Supper, even though there's bread and wine there, physical elements, along with the body and blood of Christ, 
still spiritual because it's inside the kingdom of God, the church, as we gather to worship. I mean, how can it be more tactile? How can it be more uh, carnate than that? But it is spiritual. Okay? It's because it's within the kingdom of Christ. Uh, the great St. Paul is of the flesh, sold under sin here. So what chance do we have to not be the same? So if you th think of if you think of this improperly, you're going to wind up thinking of yourself as better than St. Paul, which is kind of an odd way to think. We have the old man, new man struggle depicted here and in the following verses. The old nature is what we are born with. The new nature is what we are reborn with through the waters of baptism. And now we have this tug of war. I like that picture. Uh, with, within us. Verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very things I hate. The struggle is within all of us. Notice again, Paul says, I, he's not putting himself above uh, the people who read the letter. On the other hand, remember it's being read in the congregation. So the lector does not say, Paul does not understand his own action when he's reading this. The lector says, I do not understand my own action, putting it in him. And as we sit down with our Bibles and we read, we should not read, for Paul did not understand his own actions, for he did not, we're supposed to read, I. So it becomes personal for all of us. Every man. Every man. So yes, this is about Paul, but it is about far more than Paul. It is about each one of us. We often know what is right. We approve what is right. We admit that those who do what is right are doing what is right. And yet we fail to do what is right. How often does that happen? Those Christian traditions that believe we become perfect in this life, who teach Christians uh, get to the point where they live without sinning, once they have become perfectly sanctified, should read this passage again and embrace the I so that they can repent. They need to remember passages like uh, 1 John 1, 8, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we say we have no sin, we call God a liar because he said we're sinners. That's right. That's right. So uh, I'm not going to call God a liar. If he says I'm a sinner, even if I'm too thick to figure that out, I'm going to trust Jesus. <laughs> Verse 16. Is there, you know, it looks like our spinning circle of death is still there. I hope this goes. Well, if not, we'll have it and we'll just post our post, own Yeah, okay. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. You know, the fact that we uh, innately agree that murder, prejudice, envy, malice, hatred, greed, lust, and on and on and on are bad for the most part, though we may, of course, excuse ourselves at times because we read about that way back in uh, Romans 2. Sometimes we'll excuse our bad behavior as it's really not that bad. Usually we do that by comparing us to somebody truly heinous. You know. Yeah, okay, I, I'm a bigot. I admit it. But at least ways I'm not running around murdering millions of Jews like, like Adolf Hitler did. I can always find some Adolf Hitler in history to make me look pretty darn good, you know, sort of a thing. Um, but anyways, uh, we also uh, will always affirm things like love, mercy, forgiveness, charity, faithfulness, kindness, and so forth, so forth and so on. We recognize those as good, 
positive trait, and I don't care how much of a sleaze you are, you still will say, well, yeah, okay, love is good, kindness is good. I may not be the greatest uh, at those things, but I, I know that they're good things, you know. Uh, but because we recognize and endorse these things that the law says are good, and because we condemn those things that the law says are bad, we reveal that the law is good. It is a good standard. My actions, either in conformity to the law or in opposition to the law, reveal the goodness of the law. My actions, my thoughts, reveal that that standard is a good standard, a good rule. Because we are sinners, Paul focuses on what we do that violates this law, which is what our old man revels in doing. Verse 17. So, now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, again, Paul is, is moving around with this word, word I. Again, we want to always identify it as I. But who is this I? This I is the baptized believer. It is the baptized Paul. It is the believer Paul. It is the converted Paul. And that sin that dwells within me, that's the old man, the old nature in him. So inside us, we have the, the baptized new nature and the unbaptized old nature. The baptized believer, the unbaptized rejecter. So... You're saying verse 16 is the unregenerated man. For I do, yes. 17. No, the, I do not do what I want. What I want is the new man. No, if I do what I do not want. Okay, so both verses are, are about. This war within. The baptized Christian. The war that's within. That's speaking to. Well, uh. Yes, you know, okay. Now, if I, as a baptized believer, uh, now, if I do what I do not want, okay, if I, as a baptized believer, do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law, the baptized believer, agrees that the law is good. I admit that. I admit that our cartoon guy holding up his thing. That's a good standard. Okay. So now it is no longer I who do it. Baptized person again, not the, the new man, but sin that dwells within me. That old man, that old unbaptized nature okay. that is within me. He got the upper hand. <laughs> ah, he is not talking about Sark's. The, 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 the fleshy flesh. The, the fleshy the flesh. Touch, the yes. Flesh. Yeah. He's not, you know, uh, uh, I just hope you get it because we're not talking about physical versus non physical, corporal versus non corporeal. We're talking about baptized nature versus unbaptized nature. The part of us that's never converted this side of the grave. That's right. Okay. Within us, there is always an, a, a sinner looking for an opportunity to express himself. So you have to be on your guard. We're going to be getting to that in just a minute. Okay. So that's uh, is for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. My old nature there that lived in the kingdom of the devil and revels in that kingdom of rebellion against God. That's what he means here in my flesh. Uh, for I have the desire to do what is right. The baptized man always wants to do what is right. He never wants to sin. That is always the sin nature within us, the flesh within us, the old man within us, the ally of the devil. This 
old nature is always the devil's ally. The new man is always the ally of Jesus, always wants to do what is right. For I have the desire to do what is right. The new man desires that, but not the ability to carry it out. We are always utterly dependent on Christ and his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. It is as soon as we decide that I can do it myself, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps, that the old man is gaining the upper hand. That's why Luther says we have to drown that old man every day daily it says that uh in the small catechism that's right in his discussion about baptism but that is right so daily we drown and paul is going to get to how we do that though though he doesn't use the drowning element but he talks about repentance and we're going to get to that and that's how we drown that old man every day how we return to our baptism every day as we live in repentance, trusting in Christ and not in our own abilities. So, uh, sadly, the old man often wins in this struggle. Uh, as we all know, we do not live in the power of our baptism. We do not live as reborn children of God. But that's why we rejoice that Christ is a savior of infinite patience and will always forgive the repentant Christian. It reminds me of um, Pastor CJ's uh, prayers at the beginning of the services that, that, are, that I'm watching stream on Sundays. It says, you know, forgive us for not being the people you have created us to be in our baptism. And that starts every service and it's so nice. Uh-huh. And that is absolutely true. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. So maybe he was inspired by this part of Romans, though he could have been inspired by lots of other passages. So. Okay, um, we're at verse 20, is that right? 19. 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I kept doing. I thought we just finished talking about that. Uh, okay, well, then so, we're at 20. 20, okay. <laughs> Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And of course, we are already talking about that too. Sin that dwells within me, that is in our old nature. Sin does not damage our new nature, our baptized nature. It is totally in the domain of the old nature. The I here is our new nature. We've already talked about that. Uh, our new baptized nature, which is the true Christian self. And that is where we died to sin and were raised with Christ. And all of that stuff in chapter 6 is still in full play here. So, again, uh, still got our spinning circle of death, so I know we don't have any questions. I'll move <laughs> on <laughs> to verse 21. So, I find it to be a law that I want to do right, but evil lies close at hand. Okay. Um, a law, a principle, you could say, uh, that uh, I want to do uh, right, uh, you know, is the principle of the new man, uh, principle of the new man, I want to live in the will of God, I want to, what's that? I want to follow oh, Jesus. Jesus. I want to live like a, a child, child of God. Child of I God. want to be like Jesus. Yeah. That, that's the new man singing. Yeah. That's the principle. We want to uh, walk in the steps of Christ. We want to be a good witness. Raise your hand of anybody who does not want to be a good witness in their life and words. Of course you want that. But then you know what happens when you get in that opportunity. All of a sudden, oh, 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 oh and, and, and you have these problems, okay? Well, that's not the new man. You know, the new man wants to do that. It's the old man who's bringing problems, and it happens to all of us. So it's a general principle. Even as a Christian, though, Paul says, evil lies close at hand. 
So even somebody at Paul's level, evil lies close at hand. If that's true for Paul, then what about you and me? Huh? I think I think we need to be just as watchful, which is why we're told places like in 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, to be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And guess who he wants to devour? He wants to chomp down on you. Or uh, here we have um, uh, the words, oh, this is, you know, just a Cain and Abel, right? This is before Cain does the dirty deed and kills his brother. So what does God say to Cain? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. You must rule over it. Of course, we know that Cain didn't. So it is for us. We must always be aware that our enemy is out there and our sinful nature, our old man, is looking for ways to get us to defect. It reminds you of screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. A, a, um, a, a series that he actually wrote for a newspaper and he hated writing it. By the time he was in, uh, finished it, he said he would never write anything like that again because he hated just pondering ways that the devil can deceive us. And I, I, a great, great little book. Great little book. If you've never read the Screw Tape Letters, I highly recommend it. But I would not want to have written it. I'm glad Lewis wrote it. <laughs> So I can just enjoy it. I don't have to sit around thinking, okay, now how can the devil deceive me today? Oh, oh, oh. oh. So anyways, uh, Paul has this struggle going on. This between the principles of the new man, the new nature, the baptized Christian, and his old man that he's dragging around within his uh, chest. Uh, or within his members, as he says. It's a reference to his sin nature. This nature is from below, not from above. It is all about the here and now, and it is about selfish interests. And it seems so innocent and so natural to us. I'll give you something that you uh, probably would never even think of as representing our sinful nature. Have any of you developed a bucket list? Things that you want to have done before you die, before you kick the bucket? You know, I want to go to Kilimanjaro. I want to visit France. I want to visit Italy. I want to visit Germany. I want to visit uh, uh, the Sahara or, or the Sudan or the Amazon River. I want to go down and what's that fabulous uh, temple down there in South America, Tutan oh, Common uh, or whatever uh, it is? Uh, Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. I want to go visit Machu Picchu or I want to sail around the world. What is the operative word in all of these I, things? I, I, I. I, 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 <laughs> I. Guess who is making this list? That doesn't have to be something evil. It's not, I want to make sure I'm a mass murderer before I die. The operative here is I. The operative here is me. I am the sinner. This is what I want. The rest of the world can go to the hell in a handbasket as far as I'm concerned. And there is the essence of our sinful nature. Even if we're not plotting evil in, uh, schemes, what we are scheming is to put I want there first. Wouldn't it be sweet if we could say, well, God wants me to sail around the world before I die. Wouldn't it be sweet if I could say, God wanted me to visit Machu Picchu before I died. Wouldn't it be sweet if I could say, God wants me to climb the Eiffel Tower or see the Sistine Chapel before I die. Now, none of these things are actually wrong or sinful in and of themselves. 
I'm just saying that notice that self-centered element there. We got to be careful of that. And so Paul goes on and says, wretched man that I am. Uh, who? I, we're in verse 22. 22. For I delight in the law. Yes. Uh, for I delight in the law in my inner being, inner being, uh, baptized Christian nature. Uh, he goes on in 23. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law that, of sin that dwells within my members. So again, we have this old man, new man, or as you see here, flesh and spirit. Again, the word flesh can deceive some people and thinking carnate or physical and spirit then would be incarnate or non-physical. That's not what Paul is talking about. Think in terms of the domain of Christ, the rule of Christ, the kingdom of Christ as spirit, and the domain of de the devil, the domain of selfishness, the domain uh, uh, outside the will of God as flesh. Okay, I only got 10 minutes left here. Uh, so we have uh, these two principles, kingdom of Christ, kingdom of the devil, or kingdom of Christ and kingdom of this world, as long as we don't understand everything in this world as being outside the will of God. So it's it's uh, sin, death, sin, death, and the power of the devil. That's flesh. Okay. Yes. Sin, death, and the power of the devil. Right. Uh, 24. We have this uh, going on in us, and he goes, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? What a pitiful cry. Notice again, now he has us saying this. It's not a uh, wretched person that Paul is. Who will save him from this body of death? We read I. The lector read I in the church. And when we do this in church, our lector reads I. You know, so... While it is Paul, it is a very deeply personal section of his letter here. It is a deeply personal section for me when I read this. It should be a deeply personal section for every person who reads this. For every person should read I. And not think of Paul. Think of themselves. Yeah, I saw when I was looking for graphics for this particular slide uh, I, I came across a quote I don't remember who it was from it says if you don't see yourself here you are seriously deluded yes yes uh, I would agree with a quote like that so a wretched man that I am who will save me from this body of death it is an honest question and the answer is, of course, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And right now I could get out on a soapbox and go crazy singing the praises of my Lord Jesus. Because he is the one who delivers me from sin, death, and the power of the devil. He is the one who created the new man in me through the waters of baptism. He is the one who is going to come back again on the last day and raise me and all believers from the dead. And he's going to leave my old sinful nature in the dirt to be destroyed in fire. And my new nature will be raised and dwell with him and all believers in the new heavens and new earth and joy and peace and happiness with contentment and purpose and, uh, Joy, Joy without, and, end. <laughs> without end. Can you imagine going to work on Monday morning to a job that is so fulfilling that you don't know why you go, you leave in the afternoon? Because you're never more filled with contentment and purpose. That's the sort of jobs you have in heaven. Are you a gardener? How would you like to be paid to be a gardener? You're doing it for free because you love doing it, right? That's what heaven is like. It's, it's doing something that you would do because it's just great to do. You love it. So he goes on uh, by saying, 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that may not feel like an answer to you, but it is. Thanks be to God. I don't have to save myself. Jesus did it. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now the new man is the mind. See how flexible he is with these terms? We don't think of myself as, well, I'm one part flesh, one part spirit, one part mind, one part uh, old man, one part, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not some sort of a jigsaw puzzle. We have these two natures. Or a pie chart. <laughs> yeah. We have these two natures, and it can be described in various ways. Now, mind is being used to describe the new man, and we can tell it's describing the new man because this is the part that serves God. This is the part that affirms what is good about the law. And it says, thou shall not murder. Amen, brother. That works. That's the new man. I hate with malice and a forethought. That's the flesh. That's the old man. He has these two things going on in him. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus. So I myself serve the law that is uh, with my mind. That is, my new nature rejoices in doing what is right, my baptized nature. But my flesh, my old nature, I serve the law of sin. That's going on within us. Paul offers God thanks through Jesus because he is our deliverer. Uh, think of it in terms of, of the Exodus in the Bible. You know, the Israelites were slaves. Think of that Egyptian slavery as being enslaved to sin, death, and the power of the devil, the flesh, so forth and so on. They did not save themselves. God delivered them. Christ delivered them. Jesus came and said, come on, boys and girls. This is the way, and that's probably in part why Paul speaks about baptism in terms of the Israelites going through the Red Sea. Because just as Israel was saved by passing through the Red Sea, so we are saved when we pass through the waters of baptism. And just as they came up on the other side, a new nation, so we come up through the waters of baptism a new creation as well. So when we see here that he speaks of thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that word Lord should be understood in the full Old Testament meaning. We're talking about Yahweh, Jesus Christ, Yahweh, or if you prefer, Jehovah. He is the God who created the heavens and the earth. He is the God who redeems Israel. He is the God who who meets Moses on Mount Sinai. He is the God who brings them into the promised land. He is the one who brings them back from the uh, Babylonian captivity. He is the one who called fire down from the sky for Elijah. He is the one who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, suffered, died, and rose on the third day. The Lord, Lord of Lords. Uh, so he goes on, I serve, um, so our new man is free from sin, but for now, the old and new struggle within us. Therefore, Luther was spot on when he made his first of his 95 theses, famous 95 theses, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Because we always have our old man, we always have need to repent. But because we have our new man, we know that we always have a Lord and Savior who will forgive us and welcome us with open arms. And we are just about out of time here. So perhaps it's a good thing we've got that spinning circle of death and been unable to take any questions. I uh, certainly hope that we get to post this, but for the time being, why don't we close our time together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. See you next week when we begin chapter 8. God bless.